Hello, everybody. This is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Well, welcome to this uh, Wednesday night Bible study for the Church of the Eternally Secure. And uh, with me again tonight is Sister Renee Rowland. Hi, Renee. <laughs> and uh, we've been um, really excited and anxious to uh, get to the study tonight. I know many people are uh, really looking forward to this study. And that is we are going to examine and discuss Paul Washer's famous controversial sermon, Examine Yourself. Um, the, this sermon, uh, he starts off in the sermon uh, was saying that uh, a lot of people are going to get angry about this sermon. And it, sure enough, it stirred up a huge controversy and it has angered a lot of people. So tonight, let's take a good look at this and see, is there a reason for us to be angry about his sermon? Uh, is it... Uh, um, is it biblically correct or not? That's what we're really concerned about. Sister Renee, say hi to everybody before we get started. Hey, everybody. I missed you guys. Uh, my voice is still a little off, so if you lose me there, forgive me. But I'm so excited. I'm so grateful to Brother Luke. RL, uh, Mike, thanks for filling in for me when I was sick. It was a fantastic uh, uh, spur of the moment program you guys had. Uh, your testimony is fantastic. Um, and also for Brother Luke, thanks for holding off on discussing this because this is one of the um, sermons that have really upset and scared a lot of people, but for the wrong reasons. It's not that Paul Washer's right. It's that he's absolutely wrong and confuses people. And uh, during this, the title of this is being examine yourselves, you know, uh, what I believe that context of that verse is. And I'm going to prove that to people tonight. Read that section in first Corinthians to prove to them. It does not mean what this gentleman says it means. So thank you for holding off so that I could join you on this. I really appreciate it. It's great to see you guys. Thanks for your prayers. Yeah, I, I know I speak for everybody. We're very happy to see your, your, your healthy and, and your strengths restored and, and, uh, uh, so many people have been praying for you because so many people love you and care about you and value you. I can't tell you. It's almost almost a daily routine. I'm getting letters from people thinking they're talk, want to talk to me, but they just want to go tell me all about you and, uh, and how much you've done for them. So uh, you are really appreciated. Um, okay, now, normally, whenever we do any of these studies, I don't do any real preparation. Or most of us... Uh, uh, whether it's Matthias or Daniel or Renee or myself, uh, anytime we get together for these discussions, uh, they've even asked me not to send them any questions in advance. They don't want to prepare. They want it to be uh, extemporaneous. And uh, But in this case, I decided I wanted to uh, watch him give the sermon. Uh, I, I watched it last night. Uh, so I saw him do it. I heard him do it. And... Uh, I think that uh, not only what he says, but how he says it is uh, very, very uh, important to understand, too. So I, when we go through this, I'm going to try to read the parts of the sermon in a way that he communicated it so you can see the, uh, the emotion. Is there any way to split screen it so they can see him do it? Is there a way to play it while we're live or no? Uh, there probably is. I just don't know how to do it. I don't know either. Maybe we can do that next week. We can figure it out and go back over. Maybe, maybe, we, maybe we could do that. But uh, um, I, I'm going to do the best I can in my very amateur acting uh, abilities uh, to try to uh, copy the way you You're awesome. It. It'll be good. <laughs> Thank you. Just don't sing. Don't sing. We'll be good. I, I promise you'll never, ever have to hear me singing. <laughs> okay. So let's begin. And uh, I'll, we'll, we'll take turns reading as usual. Okay. This says, the title of this is, A Sermon That Has Angered Many, Examine Yourself, preached at Grace Community Church in San Antonio, Texas. <clears throat> and uh, this is Paul Washer's words. I'm going to preach a message tonight that has angered many, many, many churchmen. It has angered many of the older people. It has angered many of the youth. 
many of the youth that I've preached this to have become fiercely angry. But the people that have become most angry at hearing this message have been the parents of the youth. I have found that there is something quite amazing among parents that if they can get some sort of a claim out of their children that they profess faith in Jesus Christ, they seem to hold on to that and it gives them assurance and joy. And it seems that they're bothered anytime someone would come and question that claim. Brother Luke, by all means, if somebody's feeling assured and joyful, we've got to rip that from them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, that's that's really we all we all know who are already familiar with this sermon that that's really the the, the result. And that's what angers everybody. Uh, but isn't it interesting how the first thing he's doing is um, saying almost uh, I, I'm getting uh, when I watched him do it, that he's uh, really very happy and, and uh, proud of the fact that uh, he and, and, and he explains this as we go along that uh, uh, this is the result that he's, he's he knows he's going to get, but he's going to do it anyway. Yeah, because. false assurance. These people have false assurance because they haven't cleaned up their life enough. They're not living the Christian life, and therefore they're not really saved. Got to mm. take that joy from them. They better look at themselves to see if they're saved. That's why we're going to discuss that very twisted verse. I'm already upset, and we haven't even gotten to the second paragraph. <laughs> okay, let me uh, I'll continue. It says, he says, it seems we would rather hold on to a false hope than to hear the truth. There are many people who do not want to hear the truth because it will shake up the false hope they have that they're going to heaven when indeed they are not. There are so many people in Christianity, uh, American Christianity, that believe themselves right with God, that believe themselves saved, because they were told that by a preacher who should have spent more time studying the Bible and less time preaching. I hear people all over the world, and especially in this country, tell me that they're saved, and I ask them, how do they know that they're saved? Well, because they believe. And, one, and no one asked them the second question, how do you know that you believe? All right. Can we, we stop right there? Do, do you have to make things so cut? He, he's making it so complicated. What he's claiming here, that faith alone in Christ alone is not enough. That if you don't have a changed life, that if you haven't really gotten rid of sin in your life, then you got to check to see if you're really a Christian. Because to me, he clearly says that how do you know you believe? Where's the proof? That's what he's looking for. Right. So can can can. Oh, I just I want to prove something. Do, do you mind if I do this? Because if I don't get this off my chest and show people that he's going to he's doing this entire this entire sermon based on a false context of a verse in Second Corinthians. OK, so his whole thing of it, people in the chat room, please listen to this right now. Because I'm going to show you that the verse, examine yourselves that you be in the faith, that Paul Washer is using and Ray Comfort uses and all the Calvinists use to tell you not to look to Christ for your eternal security, not enter into his rest and cease from our works as God did from his, because we've trusted in the true gospel, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, that it's the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, his blood that makes you clean. No, no, he's going to take this scripture out of context and tell you that you got to examine your own performance to determine whether you're saved. And I'm going to show you that verse does not mean that. When Paul tells the church of Corinth, to examine themselves. Please listen to me. He is saying, he's saying that because he's defending himself as an apostle. They have questioned him as an apostle because Judaizers had come in claiming they were teachers of the law and making them doubt whether he was qualified to preach to them. 
So when he says, you want to examine me, you want to prove me an apostle, examine yourselves, prove your own selves. Because if you're in the faith and Christ is in you, then I must be an apostle because I am the one that brought you the gospel. Let me prove that to you right here. This is not about confirming you're saved based on your performance and examining whether you're saved because of your lifestyle at all. Second Corinthians 13. I'm sorry, Luke, if I don't do this and get this out of the way, I'm not even going to be able to concentrate. Right. Second Corinthians 13. This is Paul. This is the third time I'm coming to you. In the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. I told you before and foretell you as if I were present the second time and being absent now, I write to them which heretofore have sinned. Why have they sinned? They have uh, denied or questioned that God sent him and they're questioning salvation. And to all other that if I come again, I will not spare. Since you seek proof of Christ speaking in me. Do you see this? Okay. So Paul is saying, because you, you've sinned by seeking proof that Christ is speaking in me, which to you or is not weak, but is mighty in you. So he tells them, examine your own selves to examine me. Prove your own selves to prove me an apostle. For though he was crucified through weakness, yet he liveth by the power of God. For we also are weak in him because they're trying to say uh, a person's strength and boldness of words proves that they're really, and a teacher of the law proves they're really sent of God. And he's saying, no, his strength is perfected in our weakness. And he uses the things despised of the world, but let's go. Yet he liveth by the power of God for we are also weak in him, but we shall live with him by the power of God towards you. Now, this is where he says, examine yourself, examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith, prove your own selves, why? Because he said before, since you seek proof of Christ speaking in me, examine your own selves, prove your own selves. Know you not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except you read reprobates. So he's saying, look to yourself. Isn't Christ in you? If Christ is in you, then I must be an apostle because I'm the one that preached to you. OK, he said, uh, no, examine your own selves, prove your own selves. Know that you're not your own selves, how that Christ Jesus is in you. He's saying a statement of fact, Christ is in you unless you're reprobate. But I trust that you shall know that we are not reprobate. Great. Now I pray to God that you do no evil, not that we should appear approved, but that you should do that which is honest, though we be as reprobates. For we can do nothing against the truth, but for the truth. For we are glad when we are weak and ye are strong. And this also we wish even your perfection. Therefore, I write these things being absent, lest being present, I should use sharpness according to the power which the Lord's given me to edification and not to destruction. Finally, brethren, farewell. Be perfect. Be of good comfort. Be of one mind. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace shall be with you. And that's it. So he's claiming that you want to question me. And you want to confirm Christ speaking in me, all you have to do is examine yourselves whether Christ be in you. And then you'll know. Because uh, people look for people with strong wisdom of words. Paul always said, I come to you knowing nothing but Christ and him crucified, not by wisdom of words, lest you know you be taken away from the simplicity that's in Christ. So this examine yourselves, this entire sermon is based on an incorrect contextual reading of the verse, examine yourselves that you be in the faith. And false teachers always use this verse to try to keep your eyes off of Christ. John tells us, I tell you these things that believe in the name of the son of God. So you may know that you have eternal life. Why? Because we know in whom we have believed. We're not believing in ourselves. It's not by works of righteousness, which we have done. It's a, it's not by uh, works at all. It's not by works of the law. Christ is of no effect. If it be of works, it's no longer grace. It's for him that worketh not. It's not of yourselves. It's the gift of God. So for him to do this is really sneaky. Either he's very sneaky or he has no understanding of what this verse means. So we should never look to ourselves to see if we're saved. We look to Christ because he's our foundation and no other foundation can be laid. So I had to get that out of the way, Brother Luke. Uh, otherwise, the, the whole foundation of this sermon is a fraud because it's based on a wrong context of that scripture. Yeah, uh, well, 
the way you explained that verse, it's, uh, it's really the right way to start this study because uh, that's the title of the, uh, his sermon. That's the primary message of the sermon. You very well may not be saved. It's very likely you are not saved. And, and I, I want you to examine yourself. And, and so he's misunderstanding the word. I do think he, he is, um, I don't think he's being dishonest. Um, I think he's absolutely sincere uh, about uh, what he thinks that verse means. Uh, but what he's doing, not only with this verse, but with four, five, six other verses that he uses in the sermon here that we also need to explain correctly because he's misapplying them too. But uh, what he's doing is eisegesis. He's putting into the scriptures what the viewpoint he wants to be there instead of reading it in context as you did and just accepting the actual meaning or intention of the, of the writer. So uh, uh, he's trying to take this, uh, this verse here to support the idea that he believes in that uh, the, the, in most of you are not really even Christians. Uh, so uh, let's, let's go on, uh, read a little further. Um, if we were to dismiss this congregation tonight, and send everyone out to every part of this city, we would find out that the great majority of the people in this city believe that they believe. And we know that's not true. If we were to go to taverns and crack houses tonight, if we were to go to casinos anywhere in this world, we would find people who believe that they believe. And the question is, how can we be sure that we believe when so many people say they believe and we know they don't? Uh, well, first of all, uh, uh, that statement that we know they don't, that's, like, that, that's a, the most arrogant and, and fundamentally uh, dishonest. We talked about being honest or not. That's certainly not honest because if he was going to be honest, he would have to know that he cannot read other people's minds. He cannot uh, look into other people's hearts. Uh, we talked about this so often in all of our discussions about how we cannot know if someone else is saved. We just have to accept their confession of faith. If they have the correct confession, at least they, we know they know how to say the right thing. Whether they believe it or not, we cannot prove it one way or the other, and we certainly do not prove it by examining their their uh, their uh, lives, how well they're living. People uh, with addictions are relying on God's grace more than those in the church. I guarantee there's just as many people lost in the church as there are in the bars. Yeah. He's mixing yeah. up living the Christian life with salvation. Yeah. So uh, there's a, just a, the, the false premise that uh, not only is he saying uh, most of you people are not saved. I want you to examine yourself so you can find out if you are. And uh, I already know. He says not only he says we like he and the rest of the people who are really saved. We know that most of you are not saved. So, oh, Renee, did you want to read, read some of this here? Yeah. How arrogant for him yeah. to assume because somebody's in a bar or a crack house that they're not saved. Yeah. Just a bunch of self-righteous garbage. I, I, you know what? If I saw uh, Jack Smack was talking about some guy who was smoking weed one day and he goes, you know what? I might be smoking weed, but it doesn't mean I don't trust my savior. And I was like, the guy's probably saved. I, I have more faith that he's saved because he's not trusting in himself at all. But you're going to have those in the church thinking they're living good. And like Ray Cumber said, you can't, give your heart to Jesus when you're three and think you're safe just because Jesus died, but you haven't read your Bible or lived the Christian life. What does that have to do with you being saved at all? I worry about that guy. He's trusting in his own performance. What a bunch of garbage. It all stems from them redefining repent, believe, and faith. Believe yeah. is just to take God at his word and rely on it. All right, let's see what, what it says. Okay, now... Uh, in, in America. Is where we're all right. In America, 
we have combined two doctrines and we have lost both of them. There are two very important doctrines in the Christian faith. The first one is commonly called a name I do not like, but I will use here tonight, the security of the believer. Why do you hate that? It's glorious. If you're not secure, you're not saved. You're temporarily reprieved. That every person who has truly believed in Jesus Christ is born again and they are secure. Again, he's mixing the old man and the new man as if they're one. The very God who saved them will keep them saved. Security of believer. Amen. But there's another doctrine which we do not hear much about. It is not just the doctrine of security, but the doctrine of assurance. It is, is it true that every true believer is kept by the power of God? That's the doctrine of security. This is where his Calvinism is going to come in. But the doctrine of assurance is this. How can you be assured you're a true believer? Well, because God said if we put our trust in what he did, we're saved. How can you know that you're a true believer? Because we know in whom we have believed. I've had people tell me, well, I just know that I know. I tell them there's a way that seems right unto men and it leads to death. And I tell Paul Washer, Luke, there's a way that seems right to man, like you earning salvation or proving it by your good works. Because that's what every false religion on the world focuses on, how good man is instead of how good God is. I've had people tell me, well, I know in my heart of hearts that I'm saved. The Bible says that the heart is deceitfully wicked. It goes beyond knowledge and its wickedness. Well, I know because God's word says I'm saved if I put my trust in him. Isn't that right, Luke? Yeah. So do you really want to trust a mind that's faulty? I don't trust in my mind or my feelings. I trust in God's word. Do you really want to trust a heart that can be wicked? You want to trust your righteousness, which is filthy rags? I've even had people tell me, well, I know I'm saved because the preacher told me I'm saved. Since when did men have such authority? And then worst of all, I know I'm saved because I've walked with God. My dear friends, let me tell you this. If you're not walking with God now, you can have no assurance that you've ever been saved. Garbage. Prodigal son didn't work with God, uh, walk with God. He was in a pig pen. But guess what? The father ran out and laid a kiss on him. He didn't say he stopped being my son. All right. We're teaching here tonight that if you walk with God and you're saved, then you stop walking with God, you lose your salvation. What we're telling you is this, that you never had it to begin with, of course. We have assurance that we've come to know him, not because one time we repented. Uh, here we go. It's a re re true repentance is the acknowledging of the truth. You're a filthy sinner. You fall short of God's glory. Repentance from dead works. Your dead works of the law and a faith towards God. You turn to Christ with full assurance of faith. That is true repentance, not relying on you at all. Repentance from sin is keeping the law because sin's transgression of the law. Nowhere does it say that in scripture. But we are to continuing to repent today. Here we go with the wrong repentance. That's the subtlety that beguiled Eve. Repent means change your mind. Repentance from sin is a work of the Holy Spirit. You can't ask an unregenerate person to want the things of God. It's not possible. It's not just that at one time we believe that we're continuing to believe today. It is not just that at one time we walk with him. We continue to walk with him today because he who began a good work will finish it. Well, Luke, that's true. He began the good work and he's going to finish it in me. That's where my security lies. Not in how well I put my flesh under subjection as my service to God. It says in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, 5, here we go. This is what we just discussed. Paul had come to a church, many of them professing Christ. Now, here's a lie straight from hell, Luke. This is not the context of that verse. We both looked at it and saw the context as they were questioning Paul as an apostle and if Christ was actually speaking through him. Isn't that what they're questioning? His apostleship, if Jesus is speaking through him or not? He's not questioning those professing Christ to see if they're really saved. This is a lie. He says that the, he goes to him and, and Paul had come to the church, many of them professing Christ, many of them walking in carnality, and he doesn't ask them, he doesn't say to them, let me ask you something. When was that time you first asked Jesus Christ into your heart? Again, we're not saved because we ask him into our heart, but because we believed on him. He didn't even refer to their conversion experience. He goes right to present tense and says, test yourselves in verse five to see if you're in the faith. 
examine yourselves or do you not recognize this about yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you unless you indeed fail the test? He didn't say anything like that, uh, Luke. He didn't say anything like that. He said, if Christ is in you, unless you're a reprobate, then I am an apostle. You want to see Christ speaking in me? Will you examine yourselves and that examines me? If I see someone who, let's say, for three or four years seems to have walked with God, all performance based here, love the saints, endeavors to pray, to know the word, to congregate with other believers and all of such, and then they begin to fall away gradually, they begin to walk away, they begin to allow the world and sin and other things into their life. This guy thinks he stopped sinning. They begin to enjoy the fellowship of the wicked. I don't go to them and tell them, you know, you're a Christian and you need to avoid backsliding. I go to them and say, you have made a good profession. You have declared among many that you're a believer, but now you're beginning to live like an unbeliever. It is very, very possible. You never knew him again, Matthew 7, 21, not understanding that that's talking about him. It has been a very deceiving work of the flesh because if a work of God does not continue it was never a work of God. So, Luke, I'm going to stop there. Did, was Jonah, when Jonah ran from God, was it not a work of God because Jonah ran from him? Didn't God finish that? Did, was he lost because he ran from God? Was Demas lost because he loved this present world and stopped being a disciple and, and preaching? Was Ananias and Sapphira lost because they lied to the Holy Spirit? No, they died. They suffered consequences. But the, do you see how he has just lied about the context of that verse? Yeah, he, he's uh, he's not quoting scripture. If he if he is, he's it's some version I've never heard. Uh, he's he's paraphrasing it and, and he's isolating yeah. it. He's interpreting it and and in, um, putting into the scripture his own desires for what he wants it to say. Yeah. Uh, He's not getting. He's not reading in the context. Understanding the context that you explained uh, when you when you taught that portion of scriptures, so it is uh, it is dishonest. Whether he's trying to be dishonest or not, maybe he's just deluded, and he's just uh, he's reading it the way he understands it because his mind is tainted with with that doctrine. He uh, flat out lied and said Paul saw they were being carnal. And, and decided he was going to ask them to examine themselves because they're professing Christ, but not living like it. It had nothing at all to do with what he said that meant oh, at yeah. all. Well, what, what's coming up next uh, is going to really get you even more upset when you, when you talk more about carnal Christians. But I want to back up to something you said uh, a while back uh, uh, about uh, how do you know that someone's saved and you're talking, he, he's talking about someone in a crack house, you know, or, or someone in a, in a bar, you know, uh, who, who identifies themselves as a believer, but they're in a bar or they're in a crack house. I talked about my nephew, David, that uh, actually does that. And, uh, and so he's using that as the test, you know, what's, what, what's going on in their life. That's how he determines and that's how he wants us to examine ourselves but you said something that I think was very profound. I, I, if, if I had two people and one person was in a crack house or in a bar or getting drunk uh, and, and they, they told me that, well, I, uh, you know, I, I know, I know I'm, I'm wrong for abusing alcohol and drug, but, but, you know, I love Jesus. He's my savior and I'm trusting him to get me to heaven. He paid for my sins. And, you know, it gives me that kind of a, a, a confession. Versus the person that is completely sober and saying, ah, I'm glad I'm not like that other guy. I'm, uh, I'm living really a good, righteous life. I'm going to heaven because of that, that, that proves it. Well, those two confessions, it's, it's like the, the Pharisee at the temple compared to the publican. And Jesus said it was the publican that was justified. So uh, that's how Jesus determined uh, who was uh, who was our. Uh, uh, really saved the the person that had faith, not the person that had self righteousness. Amen. All right, let's go continue. Go ahead, buddy. Okay. Uh, now, what does Paul say to this person? He says, "Test yourselves. Test yourselves. Take a test. Let me tell you something, my dear friends. Heaven and hell, eternity and death." may not be very much a reality to you, 
but it most certainly is to this preacher. I could care less whether or not your bank account is balanced or you have self-esteem. My only thing, the only thing that might keep me up this evening and still sleep from my eyes is the fact that many of you will die and go to hell. Oh, his whining, his whining, crying nonsense. He's so sincere, Luke. He's sincerely wrong. I made a, I made a video. Uh, uh, it's actually, it's it's the video I have that has the most views of any of my nine hundred videos. It's called Lordship Salvation Liars, and one of the main points I I make in the video is that um, l the there are preachers who have great powers of oratory and they have great passion the way they deliver their message and this this is a very powerful and persuasive thing this this ability that they have and and but we we don't want to be deceived and, and fall into this trap of, of just because someone is a, a powerful speaker or has emotion and he seems to have so much conviction he's almost crying throughout this he's so heartbroken for everybody that they're not really saved and people don't fall for it it's not the delivery of the message paul says he was not a good speaker he says he, his yeah. writings were better when he was there in person he's not impressive at all but it's the truth of the words that matter is it biblical scriptural truth or not okay we'll continue we got a we got a guy in a grace community exposed easy believism i i want to know why people want a gift to be difficult i said the other day if it's your birthday luke and i give you a present would you throw your hands up and back up and go no 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 that's too easy i i can't accept that I got to work for it. I got to do air. I'll do 20 push ups first so I can be worthy of that gift you're giving me. It's like they hate that salvation is free. Why do they want it to be difficult? Isn't gospel mean good news? They should be all dancing like you, Luke, with joy if they really understood what Christ had done for us. Why do they hate it? I'm, I'm glad you brought that to my attention. I just went there and, and um, removed him. His comments should not be visible anymore. I don't want our chat room and I don't want our study here to get diverted by, by one uh, you know, uh, nut. Uh, these people, this is here for a Bible study among believers and, and a, a fellowship. It's not here uh, to have one person shipwreck our whole study by, by taking, by trying to prove to that one lost person that refuses the free gift because of their own self-righteousness. Okay, let's... I don't even know what his point is. Okay, I'll, I'll read a little bit more. He says, test yourself. This is not just some whimsical thing. This is not just something to worry about for a day. We're talking about eternity. Is it well with your soul? If you test yourselves in the light of scripture, will you be found whole and complete, born again, kept by the power of God? It's time to take a test and stop relying on your emotions. Oh, God. That's all he's doing is using I know. In, here in his, in his uh, sermon and stop relying on what everyone is telling you and stop comparing yourself to other people. That's what he's doing. I know. Who call themselves Christian because the great majority of people in America who call themselves Christians are lost. What? Some, uh, oh, go ahead. Some leaders in the Southern Baptist Convention have said this. If we take seriously what the Bible says about Christianity, we would have to say that less than 10 to 15% of all our membership is even saved. Well, let me stop for a second here. Uh, that is something I happen to believe. I do believe that probably 10% of all professing Christians are saved. But it's, yeah, for me, it's a different reason than him. But not for his reason. Yeah. Not not it's, living good it's not because they've surrendered their life and made him Lord and, and doing all the things he's preaching here. It's because they're believing the false gospel. Yes. That's how you get saved. Jesus plus you being a good person. 
Yeah. Yeah. What? But the thing is, is it's perfection. You gotta see. He's making being born again into like a process, but it's a it's a split second thing. You're you're. It doesn't take you twenty years to be physically born. You're born of the spirit when you trust in what Christ did, and that is the one that cannot sin. That's the seed of Christ that can't sin. But the flesh is the old man. That's why he tells us to put off the old man, put on the new man. But this guy is acting like the flesh is perfected. Now, if he would have done this sermon and didn't make it about salvation, we could have dealt with it. It could have been, hey, are you living the faith? Are you living the calling God? We're saved unto good works. Are you living your faith? Are you growing spiritually? Are you being a good disciple? Then that would have been okay. But now he's making discipleship and service part of salvation and not only part of salvation, but claiming that if you don't continue in this, that you were never saved. So it's all based on looking at you and your performance and it's backloading works because now people are going to force works in their body to prove to themselves they're one of the elect, but they can know their elect if they have trusted in Christ alone. It's him alone that savior. And like you, I fear many are not saved. They're living the Christian life and are never born of God. They have never trusted only in what Christ did. They're trusting in their own performance. And again, Luke, when you were saying, test yourselves, he's like falling apart. Again, Paul is not telling these people to test themselves to see if they're saved. That is not the context. And this whole sermon is based on a lie. The whole thing. Frustrating. Oh, boy. I uh, I tried to go to that guy that I removed. I saw that some Hendricks had removed him. And I tried to go to his channel and just block him. Uh, somebody please block him and get him out of here completely. I don't want him just distracting us anymore. But I, when I did that, I lost my my uh, sermon, I lost my chat room, everything. I'm trying to get all that back. back. I got the sermon. familiar to me. The way he speaks is familiar. Yeah. The I'm, title of his channel and the way he speaks is familiar. And I wouldn't doubt he probably has no subscribers, no channels. It's probably a sock account. Yeah. Uh, it, do you want is. me to read I, while you I, pull I, it no, up? I'll keep reading here, but I, I, do, do, uh, I did go to his account, and it is a false account, it said. So it's not real. So just to, don't even pay any attention, please. Okay. In the chat room, let's not let him distract us. Don't wait okay. time on him. It's just he's. It's really he's working for the devil. So okay. okay. And and, he, and I'll go on. He says, and don't think that just applies to Southern Baptists. It applies to you all. He said, test yourself, examine yourself, not just some light examination. Not just hear the words of this preacher and walk out of there and allow Satan to steal the word of God from your heart. While you're here and while Christ is present and while the word is preached, examine yourself. It is a deadly thing. Sin waits outside this door. It is crouching and it desires to have you. While you are here and Christ is present, examine yourself. And examine yourselves. So many times in South America, working in the Andes Mountains, I would have to cross footbridges, gorges that you almost couldn't see the bottom. Test the ropes. Test the wood. Is this a sound bridge? Examine it carefully. Why? You get out in the middle of that thing, it breaks, you're dead. In the same way that salvation that you hold on to, that you trusted in, it might be like a horse's hair. When you swing out into eternity, many of you are going to swing out on nothing stronger than a horse's hair. And when the fires of hell blast up, you'll wither and you'll fall. Doesn't it sound like Jonathan Edwards, center in the hands of an angry God, dangling us over hell by a string? Yeah. It's, it's, it's Jonathan Edwards, and it's, uh, it, 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 he's taken, he's taken the, the fear of Jonathan Edwards and, and adding into, you're not even really saved. Uh, Jonathan Edwards was just saying, uh, get saved, 
And he's saying, you think you're saved, but you're not. Just because you believe, you don't really believe, or you, or you, you wouldn't uh, be a, a carnal. Okay, I'm going to try to, uh, Renee, why don't you talk about that portion a little bit, and I'll come back, because i got to try to pull up the chat room again. All right, here, here is the, th this is crazy to me. Again, the whole foundation is false. Paul's not telling them to ch make sure they're saved by looking at their works because they're carnal. He's just confirming that he himself is an apostle, and they can confirm he's an apostle by looking to their own selves. And uh, when the, uh, the whole issue here is repent and believe. He says, repent and believe. If people would just take the words, change your mind and believe the gospel, it would be so much more simple. Uh, that nowhere does it, it tell you to repent of your sin to be saved. Sin is transgression of the law. To repent of a sin is to repent of breaking the law, i.e. keep the law. Now, every Christian I know saved by grace believes in getting the sin out of their life once they're saved because they're not looking at the law. They're looking at God. They love God. They're grateful that they're secure and they want to serve him. But you don't have to to be saved. That's a whole separate issue. Now, when Peter, th this is what makes me crazy. When Peter is preaching to the Jews on Pentecost and tells them repent and believe, he's not telling them to keep the law more strictly. Peter goes on this whole section in Acts, read it yourself, explaining to the Jews at Pentecost how they had just crucified Jesus Christ and then goes and shows them through the Old Testament prophets and the law that Jesus is the promised Messiah and Savior of Israel and that he is both Lord and Christ and they have just crucified him. And so they're horrified. It says they're pricked in their hearts. And they say, men and brethren, what should we do? We have just crucified the promised Savior, the Son of God. So Peter says, repent and believe. Repent and be baptized, right? What does that mean? Stop your unbelief in Christ. Stop wanting him dead. Change your mind about calling for his crucifixion. And now put your trust in him because he is both Lord and Christ. And go be baptized as proof that you believe it and you're being baptized into him water baptism is a symbol see when you had to when a stranger a non-jew converted to judaism and began believing in the god of israel they did water baptism it was a symbolic thing to say that they're being baptized into the faith right well water baptism by immersion represents being buried, dying with Christ, being buried and rising again up out of the water as we rise with Christ. It is that we died, were buried and rose again with Jesus. So when Peter says repent and believe, it's not what Paul Washer is saying it means. He's not telling the Jews to keep the law more strictly. Stop your sinning and believe. Does he really think that 3,000 people made a commitment to not sin that day? No. They changed their mind about wanting Jesus crucified. They felt guilt for putting him to death and believed on him. So they had to repent. They had to change their mind about who he was and believe on him. And it's so unfortunate that people add of your sins or of sin to the word repent. We know God repents uh, of many at uh, 38 times in scripture. And you can repent toward something away from something uh you can there's one place where god says he does not want israel to repent he says let's go the long way around lest they see war i think it's the philistines we don't want them to see these uh tough guys fighting and we don't want israel to get scared and then repent and return to egypt so god said we don't want israel to repent because they'll return. So what did he want? He didn't want them to change their mind about going to the promised land and to return to Egypt. So if you don't understand that that word repent has to be understood in context, every time it's used, you have to look at what it's talking about. It says repentance unto life. That's to turn to Christ in faith. Uh, so uh, I, I don't, understand how they the repentance from dead works dead works of the law and a faith towards god
And this is the whole foundational error. One, that he's telling people that it means to examine yourselves to make sure you're really saved by your works, and that's not true. And secondly, uh, redefining what it means to believe when it just means to take God as his word and trust in it. As Abraham believed God and it's counted them for righteousness, it's the same thing. We believe God. We believe that his son paid our sin debt. And I can't go to hell because I have no sin left on my account to pay for. Jesus already paid my sin debt. Now, my responsibility as a saved person should be to walk in newness of life, to give a, be a good witness and a testimony, and to, to show the love of Christ to others. That's we're saved unto good works. But that's not part of salvation. And this man has... He is double talking because he'll claim it's a free gift. It's grace through faith, just like every Calvinist. But then they'll say you got to persevere to the end because they don't understand those scriptures. And, and I think Calvinism is straight from hell. I really do. It, it gives God a maligned character. It makes people look or John Piper say he was scared. He wasn't one of the elect. He woke up in sweat because he had an argument with his wife. Was he really one of the elect? What? I mean, St. Paul said, the good that I would, that I don't, the thing that I hate, that I do. Who will save me from this body of death? Oh, wretched man that I am. St. Paul knew the flesh warred against the spirit. But it doesn't mean we're saying dive into sin. Love, I have love for God because of the security he gives me. And I have peace. I'm not self-absorbed worrying about me all the time. Am I saved? Is my work? Is, no, I can focus on others. And give them the good news because who the sun sets free is free indeed. And all I see here, Luke, is him telling people to look to themselves, not to Christ. It's frustrating. Yeah, uh, it's amazing. I, I have a playlist titled Words Defined because uh, even the word believe and, and uh, you know, you baptism, believe, or repent. All these words are being redefined and, and misused to, to support uh, damnable heresies and um, believe as you said basically believing for salvation means that you believe that all the work for your salvation has already been co completed and, and and finished by Jesus Christ and it's applied to you you get credit for it it's it's done it's finished it's guaranteed that you don't have to do anything he did it for you that's that that's what we need to believe and if that's the correct belief for salvation uh, but how do people come think the word believe means to pick up your cross, surrender your life, and all these other things that have nothing to, work to, to do with the word, uh, the definition of the word believe? It says they're not worthy to be my disciple. Disciple. He's starting his first century church. He didn't need half-hearted people. He didn't say pick up your cross to be saved. He said my yoke is easy and my burden is light. That's salvation. All right. Do you want to uh, pick up here and read? Uh, okay. So we're, we're actually at uh, examine yourself, take the word of God. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, here we go. With some more examine yourself, examine yourself, take the word of God and what the word of God says about a true Christian and examine yourself in light of it. And if you fall short of the test, repent and believe. We just discussed that. Throw yourself upon the mercy of God. Cry out to him until a work is done. The work was done 2,000 years ago, and that's what I'm resting on. And that's another thing, isn't it? A whole other sermon until the work is done. The silly Christian in America, repeat these words after me. Luke, has any of us ever said, say this prayer and you're saved? I, I think we should rephrase his, his line there and, and say, cry out to, to Jesus Thank you. The work has been done for me. Thank you, Jesus. That's the cry that we need to make. Not cry, let me help you get I have the never, never seen you or any of us go online and say, hey, say this prayer after me and you'll be saved. No, we say this is what Christ did for you. Put your trust in it. Rely completely on his redemptive work. And he paid all your sin. Trust in your Savior. That's salvation. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Thou shalt be saved. Sinner's prayer is not biblical. I think it's good to pray like you said, but we should be praying in Thanksgiving. Thank you for saving me. You know, yeah. but he thinks 
that if you just simply believe, that means you said some prayer and you believe that your prayer saved you. None of us have ever said anything close to that. Yeah, he's going to he's going to get to that in the come soon too, but what that line here is really getting me. He says cry out to him until a work is done. The work was done like you said. Yeah, cry out to him that the work has is done. He, yes. He did it done, done not do. He doesn't realize it is done. It is finished. He's talking about he who began a good work and you will do it until the day of Christ. Yeah. Well, yeah, because he's already made me a new person. There's a, you know, the flesh isn't new. There, there, there's a saying that I, I heard a brother saying that I, I, it's worth repeating. He says, religion is do, do, do. Christianity is done. Done. Exactly. That's the difference. And then, okay, so he says, uh, that's a good catch you made there, Lou. Cry it till a work is done. Okay, the silly Christianity maker, repeat these words after me. Again, despising the free gift. No, you might have to wait upon God. You might have to cry out to him until the work is done. A true work, a finished work, a complete work. I'm sorry, didn't Jesus say as he his spirit left his body, it is finished? Totalistai, paid in full. And we, we who have believed do enter into rest. We have ceased from our works as God ceased from his. Can we take a test? How can we test our life? How can you test yourself tonight to see whether you're truly a Christian? Uh, what are you trusting in, yourself or Christ? There's the test. We just have to go to the word of God to do that. Go to 1 John chapter 5. I knew it. They always take that book, which is about fellowship with God and brethren and make that a test for salvation and that is not a test for salvation that is a fellowship book if i've ever seen one first john they always pick first john twisting that twisting uh hebrews and twisting james uh first john is clearly discussing some gnostic teachings that needed to be dispelled and about fellowship and how we should be loving one another uh, as brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, it's really unfortunate because they the new Bibles twist it, uh, Brother Luke, where it says, one born of God doth not commit sin, for the seed of Christ is in him, and he cannot sin. It'll say one born of God won't practice sin anymore, and all this stuff. It has nothing to do with practice. The word in Greek is not the word for practice sin. It's the word for not even once. It's impossible for that person, that reborn spirit, to sin even once. The seed of Christ, he cannot sin. That's now, when that I man. when I watched his him do this sermon last night. Uh, I want to uh, give everybody like an advance warning to get this thought in your head as we continue on. Uh, the best deception is mixing truth and lies together. If it was all one lie after another, it'd be too obvious. Right. But you make it, you, you, you put some truth in there, but you distort it with some lies and you ruin it, you pervert it. That's what he's doing. And every one of these, these, these proof texts that he, he uses, he gives you a little bit of proof, a little bit of uh, truth, but then he twists it. And Brother Luke, if it was true that it really meant if you're really saved, you wouldn't practice sin. Well, here's a vague notion. What is practice? I used to say, I don't need practice. I'm really good at it. <laughs> but you don't. What is practice? To Every five minutes? Every five years? Once a week? There's the vagueness. What does practice sin mean? It doesn't even mean that anyway. It's, he's saying that the spirit, the new saint, the reborn guy, he can't sin. The seed of Christ, the Holy Spirit is sinless. He can't sin. That's what First John's saying. It's the new man versus the old man. It has nothing to do with uh, practicing less sin in your life. And there's another vague notion. Where is that? What What's the standard to know? What practicing sin to you might be different than me. What if the guy, is, what if she's a, uh, a heroin addict prostitute and she's now, she gets sick when she can't use her heroin. So she has to do it daily just so she doesn't vomit and die of withdrawal. Uh, but she stopped the prostitution. Well, is she practicing sin? She's made some progress. So is she really saved? Do you see what I'm saying? Whereas somebody that didn't have an addiction, 
I don't know what practicing sin is. They watch porn every two weeks. What? What's practicing sin? And they don't realize the depths of sin, the, the thoughts we have, foolishness, worry, the sin of omission, you know, and this using first John as a standard to see if you're saved is insanity. It's fellowship. One of the, one of the most important things that Jesus did in his message, besides believe in him for salvation is, uh, is that uh, making us understand what the definition of sin is. So there's no wiggle room for us to, to um, let's call it, make it easy legalism. Jesus uh -huh. said, uh, they say, people say that, you know, don't murder. But I say, if you even hate someone, you've already murdered them in your heart, your mind. That they say, don't commit adultery. But Jesus says, if you even uh, have lustful thoughts, yep. then you've already committed adultery in your mind. Now, why does he do that? Because he doesn't want to give us any wiggle room so we, we have any way, any excuse acting like we're not sinning. Yep. So uh, the, the problem is the people who actually think that they can quit sinning and that they've done it, uh, they're so they're first of all they're self righteous and that's a sin. And they're deceived. They're boasting. They're they're boasting that's a sin. They're deceived and deluded. That's a mental illness. Uh, but what they've really really done is they they've watered down it so much. That, but he Jesus didn't allow them to do that. He showed them how strict it was. He ratcheted it so tight there was no way of escaping. You're a sinner. Everybody's a sinner. There's no way out of this. You're convicted. Amen. And you know what? Do you know the verse we use? I tell you these things that believe on the name of the Son of God so that you may know you have eternal life. He even takes that wonderful security verse and tears that up. Look, 1 John chapter 5, 13, John gives us a reason in his gospel. In John chapter 20, verse 31, he tells us why he writes his gospel. He writes his gospel so men might believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that he's the Christ, that they might have eternal life. Now, when it says might, Luke, it doesn't mean, oh, maybe if you do get it up. No, it means therefore so you can is what it means. Uh, believe that Jesus, Son of God, is the Christ, that they might have eternal life. Why does he write this epistle? He tells us here in 1 John chapter 5, 13, these things, this epistle, I have written to you that believe in the name of the Son of God. Those of you who profess Christ, do you see how he added that? It mm -hmm. didn't say those of you who profess Christ. Why? That you may know that you have eternal life. Well, that, that is given to us to give us security. It's good news. You want to know whether or not you're born again? Read the book of 1 John, because the book of 1 John is made up of a series of tests, though it's not. Well, why, why, what I want to know is on this, on this scripture and others, why doesn't he just read the scriptures and let it speak for itself? I know. Why does he, he read the scriptures? 1 John is a to, test to see yeah, if you're really saved? He, he reads half of the scripture he eisegetes, he puts in his own thoughts, his own religious doctrine. He inserts it right in the middle, and then he can read the rest of the verse. He's Nowhere does it say this is best to see if you're really a Christian. It's about, he said, you know what First John tells us? It says, I write these things so your joy may be full. Am I right on that? Hmm? Doesn't he say that somewhere in the letter? Yeah. I write these things so that your joy may be full. So the purpose of it is to dispel false Gnostic teachings, to kill the teaching that man does not have original sin, because that was a Gnostic teaching. That's why he said if a man says he has no sin, he deceived himself. To dispel the antichrist notions that Jesus is not the son of God or that he didn't bodily rise. And to help them get fellowship with their brethren and fellowship with God. So their joy may be full. It is not a test so that they can get scared wondering if they're really saved or not. And so he says right here, uh, he says that you want to know whether you're born again, read the book of 1 John because the book of 1 John is made up a series of tests and we're going to take those tests this evening. And I pray to God that God gives you ears to hear. So everybody gets to judge their own selves, how great they are. I'm such a good Christian. I must be saved. And I want to tell you something. I want to make it very, very clear. Do not listen to your heart. Listen to the word of God. Do not listen to what your daddy says about your salvation. Do not listen to what your mother says about your salvation. Listen to the word of God. Compare what you know about your secret life. Garbage. No. The word of God says that if you believe on him, you shall never die. 
Now, what did I say that for? So many of you young people, you have your parents so deceived, it's unbelievable, because externally conform to their law, but it's not your law. You know, uh, Brooke and I were talking about this tonight. Her and her friend went to a church one night, and he told them that they couldn't listen to rock music or go to movies and all this, so they were going to go to hell. Do you know, she was already saved, but her other girlfriend was a Jehovah's Witness. She never went to church again. She says, I can't do that. I'm not ready to give up my fun. So I can't be saved yet. Instead of giving her the gospel, telling her the good news, God doesn't ask you to do anything except believe in him. The Holy Spirit could have come into her and he could have begun that work on her. But you tell an unregenerate, unsaved person, they got to want the things of God and give up things that they think are fun. They will never get saved. And that is wrong. It is blocking the kingdom. Plus, Brooke was already saved. But what that did is it made her scared of God. She didn't want to read her Bible. She stopped going to church because every time she was scared, she'd feel condemned and that God wasn't approving of her and he didn't love her anymore. So this garbage does nothing but strengthen sin and keeps people from coming to God. This is doing this, no one this, any favors. This sermon is diametrically opposed to a Charles Spurgeon sermon we did. Yes. A word of Faith, where he says at every point that that washer is making spurgeon makes the point saying that's wrong he that's right that's right in his i'm gonna story. finish this paragraph and then I'll, I'll stop okay it says and in a secret place you know who you are and then some of you who are not children but adults teenagers that are older and that are in out in the world you go out there you know who you are your mom and dad they do not know some of you adults, church, church members don't know, but when you're out there by yourself, that's the person I want you to compare to the word of God tonight. Not the one here that looks pretty, not the one in here that's got religious makeup on, no. The one out there that, that is when no one's looking, you take that person and compare him tonight to the word of God and see if he stands, see if he stands. So you gotta look at your own self-righteousness and compare yourself to whatever vague standards he thinks First John's given you for salvation when it's really so your joy may be full in fellowship. Now, when he uses the word repent, he means you've got to change your life. Yep. The way, the way that's the whole point of this, you repent and change your life. That, that, that's the only way you're going to be a real Christian. Uh, but, but Spurgeon says, you can't even repent unless you have the Holy Spirit. It's just a false repentance. No, well, a, a lost person can never really re repent and and, and uh, get sin out of their life. Only with the help of the Holy Spirit do we have any chance of of changing. Okay. Get um, this guy out of the chat room so that all come to repentance. Yeah, to turn to Christ in faith. Just stir it. Look, if you don't like grace, if you hate grace. Just get out of here. Go listen to Paul Washer and John MacArthur and Ray Comfort. Go have fun over there with those heretics. I want to know why. Uh, first of all, I'm seeing people here that don't even have the wrench that should have it. Uh, and I click on their name. It should give me an option of, of giving them the wrench, but I'm not getting the option. I don't have the option. Uh, that's crazy. Uh, it doesn't seem to be even functioning uh, properly. So if you do have a wrench, the only one I can see is Hendrix. Uh, Hendrix, you got your work cut out for you because um, I wanted to give RL the wrench, but I can't. I, the, technically, it's not working correctly. Is there nobody else? Hendrix, sorry to have you burdened down with this, but uh, uh, you're the only one I can see that actually has a wrench in the group. Where's the other uh, moderators? Yeah, RL, can you keep an eye on that? I don't know. I, he's tried to block him already, but he keeps opening up new accounts, and we're kind of sick of him. Yeah, but I uh, see. I, I'm supposed to be a click on the three dots, and it gives me the uh, a button to, to make him a, a moderator, but it's it's not it's not doing it for me. Okay, well let's just ignore it and go. RL, on. did you get that message? Hendrix needs help. Okay. All right. Can we, let's continue. Okay. All right. Go ahead. Okay. Um, you say, Brother Paul, you seem quite intense tonight. You got, you got somebody. I think it's Bill and one of his friends in here starting trouble. What's he saying? Grace Gospel Community exposed. We need to repent. You're a bunch of heretics. Oh, like that. I'm sorry, Luke. Yeah, you're, you you were had your mic running there for that. My yeah. mic was on. I'm so sorry. Yeah, let me see. Uh, I'll start again here. You say, Brother Paul, you seem quite intense tonight. 
how would you expect me to be if a train, a slow moving train was going across our path and to see my little boy just inches from the wheel? Would you expect me for me to whisper in his ear, back up boy? Would you expect for me uh, to just not even make a commotion, but kind of motion with my hand? Or, or would you expect me to scream out, no? How would you expect me to preach about these things? Let's take that, that secret life of yours and compare it to the word of God. First John chapter one, verse five, this is the message we have heard from him and announced to you that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. What does that mean? As in all the writings of John, he leaves things open. He leaves things open. I believe that. As you look through this text, you will find that out that there are two things John is saying. First of all, whenever we're talking about light, we see this in John chapter 3, we're talking about holiness, righteousness. God is a holy God. He is a righteous God, has no sin, no flaw, no shadow, no speck of immorality in him. So see, he's He's, he says some truths, and we can all say, yeah, 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 yeah. And then he'll twist it and misapply it. God cannot be tempted. You can, you can be tempted because there is still an element of evil in you that is drawn to evil. God has no evil in him. Evil cannot draw him. He disdains it. He despises it. He's holy. But, that, but that's not, I think, John's primary meaning here. John is dealing with a group of false teachers, well, takes one to know one, who basically, <laughs> who basically are telling everybody that God is a very dark and shadowy hidden figure and that knowledge about God is esoteric. It is hidden and dark and only some people know it. And I believe, now, uh, he's alluding to uh, the Gnosticism that you talked about in this chapter, so he's alluding to that. And I believe that John is contra contradicting these false prophets, and he is saying this, and you listen very carefully. This is what he is saying. He's saying God is light, and he means this. God has revealed to us who he is, and he has revealed to us his will. He, he has made it very clear. Now, let me say something about how that would change everything in America if the media truly believed that. What kind of God do we have in America? What is the God of the politician in America? It's this kind of God. It's a God you can pray to, but you cannot define who he is. It's a God you can talk about in a political speech, but you cannot define what his will is. Well, I got to say, we, we, the God tells us what his will is, and that's the will of the Father is to believe in the Son. And, and that's what that's the point that he's going to totally ignore. If you, want to do the will, if you want to do the will of the Father, you believe in the Son. That's what we do. That's what pleases God. That's the only way to please God. Faith is without faith, you cannot please God. Because you're no longer accountable to a God like that. You don't know who he is and you don't know what he wants. So you just do whatever your carnal, wicked heart wants to do. That's a very convenient God. And that's the kind of God some supposed Christians have. You just made a good point, Brother Luke. When you said the, the part that he's twisting was actually in regards to Gnostic teaching. And you said it perfectly because here is what he's referring to. Little children, it's the last time. As you've heard that Antichrist shall come. Even now there are many Antichrists whereby we know that it's the last time. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they'd been of us, they would no doubt have continued without, with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not of us. But ye have an unction from the Holy One and know all things. I have written unto you, not because you know not the truth, but because you know it. And no lie is of the truth. Who is a liar but he that denieth Jesus is the Christ? He is the Antichrist that denies the Father and the Son. Whosoever denieth the Son, the same have not the Father. But he that acknowledges the Son has the Father also. So that is exactly what he's referring to, Luke. This isn't a test to see if you're really saved. Also in 1 John, it says, I write 
uh, these things we write unto you that your joy may be full. Not these things we write unto you so you can test if you're really a Christian. And then it says, um, uh, when it because it's talking about in him is no darkness, that is in reference to confirming that these teachings were antichrist and Gnostic. And then it says, and uh, these things I write unto you, your joy may be full, is then the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness. If we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. Does it say that he never saved you? If, if that's the case, no. If you say you have fellowship with God and you're walking in darkness, what is this darkness? Not loving the brothers and being in false Gnostic teaching that's anti-Christ, okay? If we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, that's also a Gnostic teaching is addressing here. We deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. We confess our sins. He's faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and the truth is not in him. That is ab um, actually saying that if these people were claiming there was no such thing as original sin, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This was Gnostic. And if they say they can't, they didn't sin, that they're liars because Jesus came to save sinners and this whole thing again is so the joy may be full and that they can fellowship with god fellowship with one another and walk in the light as he is in the light and this and uh he says i tell you things at the end so that you sin not but if you do sin we have an advocate with the father so uh it's silly to take this thing as a test and say it's saying that if you're true truly saved you won't practice sin well, if, if a true person never sins again because they're saved, why does he say don't sin? Because it wouldn't make any sense. It's completely out of context. And, and this is surely not a test to see whether you're a saved person. This is a letter so their joy may be full so they can fellowship with God and fellowship with one another and dispel these antichrist Gnostic teachings. Mm -hmm. It is nothing to do with testing to see if they're saved. That is the worst exegesis I, worse eisegesis i've ever heard of this book yeah the uh the, the in the first chapter of first first john there's um uh, there's some verses there that that are really misused the roman church uh they uh they say um take the verses if if um if we confess our sins he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness they take that verse to uh, as the foundation for their confessional booth to the priest but those verses i think it's verses eight and nine it's it's making the point that if we say we have no sin we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us not only applying it to the gnostic viewpoint denying the, the sin nature but but any person even living today that supplies it we have to understand that we are a sinner all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Uh, that, there, that there is no one righteous, not even one. We need to understand and accept that because only when we understand that we're a sinner and we can't resolve the sin problem on our own, are we going to understand our helpless, hopeless situation and our need for the Savior. So um, the idea in, in those verses is for a person to realize they're a sinner and if we confess to God, I'm a sinner, I need to be saved, Jesus is relying on you, that's what they should be getting out of those, those verses. <clears throat> okay, let's, uh, let's see. Uh, I don't remember who read last, uh, but I'll go ahead. But John counters that... And he says this. Oh, no, I remember. I read last. Oh, well, you want to read from here, sister? But John counters. You there? Okay, I'll go ahead and read it. Are you still there, though? Okay, maybe you will have to step away. All right. But John counters that, and he says this. No, my friend, 
God has told you exactly who he is, and God has told you exactly what he requires of the old man. He's not a hidden God. Now learning that, let's go to the next verse. What he's doing, is he rewriting scriptures? He says, John, he says, God tells you this, John tells you this, and then he says in his own words something that is not the scriptures at all. Now he goes on to say, he says this, if we say that we have fellowship with him, what does that mean? If we say that we are saved is exactly what it means. No. No. Having fellowship with him and that if we are saved are not the same things. If we say that we know him, if we say that we abide in him, knowing him and abiding him, this is not the same thing as, as uh, fellowship. For, for so many years in America, because of a certain seminary that has propagated this, we have been taught and led to believe that 1 John is talking about the difference between a Christian who walks in communion with God or a Christian that does not walk in communion with God. They take this text to mean that if we say that we know him, if we say that we know him, uh, if, if we say that we know him and yet walk in darkness, we're just a confused Christian. That's not what this text means. Let me see if you're still there. Is everything functioning? Renee? Let me see. Let me go to the chat room and see what's going on. Oh, can you hear me? No, uh, that, I, I was I looking. I had to leave or something. Okay, sorry. I didn't have my mic off. Uh, you were just talking about how he's saying fellowship is actually salvation. That's not true. And I also wanted to say it's not us knowing God. It's him knowing us. It says in Galatians 4, 9. But now after you have known God or rather are known of God, how turn you again to the weak and beggarly elements whereunto you desire to be in bondage? He's like you're known of God. See, when you're saved, you're known of God. God knows you. And it says if any man love God, the same is known of him. But uh, it tells us clearly that uh, it's God that it's more important that God knows us, you know. And so uh, you and I were just looking at John, first John, which is clearly about fellowship and our joy being full. And it's not about salvation. It's not having fellowship with God doesn't mean because you can be a child of God and not be walking with him. You can be saved. And, and be walking after you and, and living after the flesh and not not fellowshipping and seeking God. That's possible. It's possible. That's why Paul, Peter, Paul, and all y'all are constantly telling us, reminding us that we're a new person in Christ and that we need to take off this old man and uh, walk in the new man and remember who we are, that the old man died with Christ. Let's walk in newness. If it ha happened automatically, then we wouldn't have all these epistles of these uh, apostles promoting fellowship with God. They're, they're, the, the Church of Corinth was extremely uh, carnal. And, and if it were this day and age, Paul Washer would say everyone in the Church of Corinth was unsaved. Yeah, that's that's coming up in the sermon. We'll get to that next time, I think. But, uh, but the fellowship is not salvation. Uh, I, I think the best way of understanding this fellowship between us and God is, is uh, the, they call it the parable of the prodigal son, uh, but I, I would call it the, the, the story of the backslidden son. I don't know what prodigal really means, but it's, clearly he's backslidden. First of all, this son was um, born from his father, just like we are born from, from our father, God. And um, that that never changes throughout the story. His his uh, uh, status, um, uh, his standing, never changes. He never uh, stops being his son. It's nope. impossible. It's impossible for that standing to change. Now his state, his condition, his relationship that changes because, but not because God disfellowships him. The father perfect in that example. story. That's a perfect example, Luke, about fellowship. The father in that story never turns his back on his son and says, unless he comes back on his knees repenting into the changed life, 
I'm he not, didn't even let him. He didn't even let him apologize. No, he didn't. So the, the the son he went off and got in the pig's pen, but he didn't change into a pig. He's still right. the man's son, wallowing in the pig pen. And that's this that's this a son of God, a child of God, a born again person living off in the world in sin. And 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 uh, but he doesn't change into a pig. He's still a son. That when he when he realizes he's wrong and comes back. Before he can even repent and apologize or anything else, the father embraces him because even though the son had left fellowship with the father, this father never disfellowshiped the son. Right. So, and he wanted to grovel and say, hey, I'm not worthy to be your son. Just take me as a slave. He didn't even let him. No, yeah. put the, give him a kiss, put the ring on his finger, walk in the authority as if you're my son. He did. And then we're forgetting about the other son who was self-righteous and bitter. Mm -hmm. You know, we forget about that guy. And, and, and it's a perfect example of this. When people hate that God saves us unworthy, carnal sinners like us, you know, how dare that? Hey, how come he gets it when I've never done nothing wrong? I've been faithful the whole time, Dad. How come you never threw a party for me? Meanwhile, God's like, hey, everything has always been yours. You know, what? I, it's just crazy to me. Okay, uh, we're close to our uh, 90 minutes being up here. So Man. this, uh, uh, I'm going to mark here uh, what this text is saying is this. Uh, we'll pick up there next time. And um, so let's do this. Let's go look at the chat room comment for a couple, spend a couple okay. minutes and just respond to them. What this, I'm trying to make a note here because this won't let me uh, uh, actually highlight the part and, and I have to write it down. This text is saying, okay, so now let's go to the uh, the chat room and see. Uh, uh, I, like what, I like what RL said. He said the other son was bitter because legalism is abstinence from things you want to do, but fear doing. And, he, and this is crazy to me, and he's absolutely right, because the difference is, you know, he's explaining grace too. The thing with grace is he always has a license to sin. But like you said, you did what you wanted before you were saved and you do what you want after you're saved. And they're, they're just different things. And it's like, now I have the freedom. I am free, but I don't, I'm free to love and serve God in peace. I, I don't want to offend him or hurt him or do, cause I, I don't want to hurt him. I don't want to hurt his heart. I fail, but they, they act like if they don't have bondage and fear to keep them in line, that they would just go crazy. I had one right. Hey, if that was true and, and I had eternal security, I would just go party and fornicate every night. And I was like, well, you got some big issues then. Like that you got if you if you think that's gonna fulfill you, I, I mean, when when people have trusted Christ and they get the Holy Spirit, I have I get grieved. Like if I grieve the Holy Spirit, I feel grieved. It doesn't feel good. It just you never can do it and feel good about it, you know. But to me, it's more about loving people. It's more about how I treat people. If I can be more selfless and listen to what they need and, and, and this kind of thing. It's not so much, don't drink that wine. Don't touch this. Don't, don't, you know, touch not, taste not. That's not what I'm talking about. I really think it's a, an issue of loving people and loving God. It's not a bunch of law keeping. I just, I have no fear. Like a lot of people write me. If I watch this movie, am I sinning? Am I, well, does it grieve you? I mean, it's like we're free to do all things, but does it edify you? Does it make you think on good things? Does it lift you up? I mean, that this is the standards, I think. It's not that we need fear to, to force us to not do these things. I, I don't understand this whole argument, Luke, that it's a license to sin. If they ask St. Paul, well, shall we sin so grace may abound? God forbid. But if somebody doesn't ask us that, Luke, after we give them the, the gospel, we haven't given them the right gospel. If they don't go, so I can just do whatever I want, we haven't given them the right gospel. Yeah, that's a very good point. I'm, I'm really glad you said that because uh, that's comforting. But to all of us who are getting that, uh, that, that is a, a natural for a lost person who, who doesn't get it. 
Uh, that's that's the first thing that's going to come out of their mouth, and we hear it over and over again. But it should not, it should not be discouraging. It's the first time anybody's ever said that. Thank you, sister, because really that's telling us, Amen, sister. You're doing. You just gave them the real gospel because they wouldn't tell you that unless you told them the real gospel. You just the give same them the same yeah. St. Paul got the same objections, didn't he? Yeah. He said yep. that if he would add circumcision, if he would add one work, the offense of the cross would cease. Yeah. If they had yeah. one thing they could boast in. Yeah. You know, I, that's the point I wanted to discuss uh, next. Uh, you're reading my mind. But this, this answer Paul gives about examine yourself. Well, um, you know, I, I understood that verse differently. Uh, I used it differently, uh, not the way Paul Washer uses it. But uh, after I heard you explain, it, I said, yeah, that makes much more sense in context. So, uh, but that, the reason uh, Paul goes into that is because he's being attacked and he's defending himself. And how many times in the epistles is Paul under attack you're not a real apostle. Not you know, that's not the true Met gospel, and and uh, he continues. I, I, I bet you four or five times in the epistles he, he goes into a, a defensive mode and, and uh, starts defending himself against these false charges. Like life is sin. Well, why is he talking about that? Because he's being accused. Right. Of preaching, you, uh, you know, you got a license to sin. Go ahead and sin all you want. And he says, "No, God forbid. I'm not saying that at all. You're twisting, twisting my words." But guess what? Every time we are uh, accused of these things, we're in the best company. That's yeah, right. We're in the company of the Apostle Paul because we're being accused of the same things That's he was right. accused of over and over again in all of his epistles. Um, there is a, a guy, Al, your pal, Al, your pal, this is for you. You were saying that repent often means to feel sorrowful. Yes. The Greek word metamalami is often translated as repent as well. Metanoia, metaneo is the noun verb of change your mind, which is translated to repent. But in this case, the word in Genesis six, that it says, uh, and it repented the Lord, he made man on earth and it grieved him at his, his heart. That is, he felt sorrowful that he had created man. It's not that he changed his mind. The word is not metanoia. The word there is metamalami. It's a whole different word. Uh, but in Hebrew, I'm not sure what that word is. But that is absolutely right. It means when it repented the Lord, it means he felt sorrow in his heart that he had made man. It hurt him that he had made man. He was sorrowful. So, yes. The word repent can mean that as well. It just depends on what the root word is being used or translated from. So I just wanted to answer that. Uh, there's another word for repent that means irrevocable, like the gifts and calling of God are, are without repentance. That means irrevocable. It cannot be taken back. So there's three Greek words, metamalami, metanoia, metaneo, and one other one that I can't pronounce very well. And that mm -hmm. one means irrevocable. But we always have to look at because repent is translated from so many words, you have to either look at the context of the surrounding scripture to know what they're repenting towards or from, or if it's sorrow or if it's change of mind or if it's irrevocable. Um, that's the only time I go back to the original is to find out what that is. So yes, that means he was sorrowful, not that he changed his mind. Well, Sorry. Uh, um, earlier in the program, I told you that I, um, uh, somehow lost the text and lost the uh the chat room and i had to go back and, and bring that block back up but i don't know if that's what caused the technical problem and i'm not able to access the chat room and and, and can make changes the way i usually can <clears throat> so i'll be careful uh, next time uh but what i want to do is everybody in the chat room now uh please listen carefully uh uh, I, we really appreciate you you being here with us um, in this congregation, studying along with us. Uh, we appreciate your questions, all of your thoughts and feedback, uh, and uh, this fellowship is wonderful for all of us. Uh, I don't know why Hendrix was the only moderator in here. Uh, many of the people, uh, there's probably five or six or seven people that seem to be regular participants that have this the wrench, you know, they're moderators, and they're not here tonight. I don't know why, but they're not. So Hendrix is on his own.
So what I would like to do is anybody who is a, a regular participant or wants to be and uh, wants to uh, get the moderator status, that way you can help us so that when, when these people come in here and try to disturb the fellowship, that we have plenty of moderators to, 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 to get rid of these people instead of relying on just one. So if you're interested in being a moderator, please make a comment now. And I'm going to go through this later, and I'll, there, I'll, there is a way that I can go back and, and um, make sure that you have that moderator status for the future broadcasts. Hey, I wanted to give this one verse Rob brought up. Uh, I actually did a video on it a while back about, you know, everybody's always saying the Holy Spirit convicts me of sin. No, no, uh, that's your conscience. The Holy Spirit will convict you of righteousness. He will convict the saved person of their right standing with God because of Christ. Uh, but the verse he's talking about, I, I love that. I did a video about a year and a half ago on this and it's John 16 and it says, it's expedient for you that I go away for if I go not away, the comforter will not come unto you. By the way, uh, the Holy spirit always comforts the saved, uh, it does not condemn or accuse that's Satan. All right. You got to can't mix up those two voices, but if I depart, I will send him unto you. And here it is. And when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment of sin because they believe not on me. So what, what, who will he convict of sin? Unbelievers of righteousness because they go to my father and you see me no more. So the Holy Spirit will convict the saved person of their right standing with God because Christ has gone to the father and he stands as our advocate. All right. And of judgment because the prince of the world is judged. So I wanted people to realize there's a difference in the voices. The Holy Spirit does not accuse you. He comforts you. He reminds you of who you are in Christ, that that dead guy, the flesh died. He died with Christ and you are alive. The new reborn spirit, you're a child of the living God. And so when you know who you are and how much God loves you, you want to be who you are. You don't want to be that person anymore. You know, so that's what people don't get. And I really get concerned because I'm thinking, Brother Luke, when it says in whom we trusted after we heard the gospel of our salvation, we believe we were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. So it's when we trust in Christ that we get the Holy Spirit. Wouldn't they know that? If they had the Holy Spirit, wouldn't they know that he never promotes the strength of sin is the law, not grace. It says sin shall not have dominion over you for you're not under law. You're under grace. So the law is what strengthens sin, not grace. And I, I get concerned, Brother Luke, because I'm like, if they had the Holy Spirit, wouldn't they know that? Wouldn't they know that when he's grieved, we're grieved, and that he, he tells us that we're in right. He confirms the unction from the Holy One, confirms that we are his children, mm -hmm. not, not accuses us. Yeah, yeah, amen. Uh, he get, gets back to this uh this issue about, uh, you know, doubts. And uh, yeah, I do believe that uh, uh, the Holy Spirit is never going to try to give us doubt. Uh, you know, it, uh, it, if we have some doubts, any issues like that, it's the enemy. It's, uh, there's, there are verses and there about our, our faith being shipwrecked and, and also the, the, fiery darts of the enemy and where this is a spiritual war that's going on and God's on our side. He's not, he's not working against us to try to cause us to have doubts. So, uh, I do think that it's, um, it's, it's, it's normal. It's common for people to have some doubts sometimes. And it is, when you do have a doubt, it is a concern that you need to, let's, let's talk about, find out what the problem is, but it doesn't, um, this is the thing that I was talking to Matthias uh, last week. We, and got into this discussion uh, on one of his programs. And I said, I, I hope that we can just make a rule that let's not say it's a law that anytime, if, so, if someone uh, says they're a believer and they have a doubt, mm -hmm. then it proves that they're not really a believer. No, I, I don't believe that. But let's not, let's not say that's the law. And let's do, let's just say that perhaps they didn't believe in first place. Let's, it's time for us to discuss things, make sure they understand everything right. Right, and, and review things. But it's not, let's not say it's a law that a, 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 a real believer cannot have a doubt. Right. Uh, okay. Uh, let yeah, me. Those, let, that, come against, those that come against you and I preaching this gospel, 
They don't realize they are working for the enemy because the gospel we give is the true gospel. It is the gospel of God's grace and not of ourselves at all. So when they come over here attacking and exposing, they are literally working for Satan. I, I really wish they would get that. Not that we're perfect, not that we're right about everything, but when you come against a person that stands day by day for the true gospel of grace, they really are coming against uh, God's message. And that's really scary. Okay. Uh, the last thing I'd like to say is uh, uh, thanks for responding in the chat room. I see that some of you have uh, uh, agreed to uh, be moderators, and I'll, I'll make sure I'll take care of that right away. Sort of the next broadcast, you'll have that status. And I appreciate all your help with, with uh, controlling the chat room. So it's, it should be a, a, a pleasant environment for fellowship, not just not a, not tension and turmoil. Uh, and we need moderators, a lot of moderators, to, to control that problem. The other thing is I want to announce that uh, uh, about a week or so ago, um, I made a video about uh, transhumanism and AI, artificial intelligence. It's about 30 minutes long. Um, some of the people that saw it have asked if uh, I could do a group discussion on the subject and a hangout like this. And so uh, I've agreed to do it. There's a couple of people that want to participate. Um, we're planning on doing it Friday at 6 p.m. Pacific. That's 9 p.m. Eastern. Um, Brother Jason Jack is uh, trying to see if he can free a schedule to, to, to join us. And Matthias will be there and a couple of others. Uh, Renee, if you're interested, I'd love to have you join us if you're interested in that subject at all. Uh, what time tomorrow? Uh, it's Friday. Oh, okay. I think he sends me the link. I think I'm on the list. I'll, I'm I'll doing, no, I'm doing. I'm doing the posting it. You so are. Okay. I'll, I'll send it to you if it's. I'd like that. You want to talk about? It. Yeah. Okay, I'll send you the link. So that'll be 9 p.m. Friday. Talking about, and I have a series of points to cover. So and everybody will have a chance to give your thoughts on all of it. And uh, if you haven't seen my video on it, it's about 30 minutes long. So between now and Friday, everybody, everybody just watch that and then. Uh, You'll be kind of caught up so that you can participate in that uh, discussion. All right. Um, all right, sister, any last words? Thank you guys for coming. I, it was, I'm so grateful, Luke, that you saved this and put it aside until I got better so we could go over this. But this is just, this is a prime example of the confusion and the double talk and how the gospel has been corrupted and turned into man-based performance religion instead of God-based faith. So thank you for um, having me tonight. Thank you guys for showing up, and I, I look forward to this. And uh, I'll, I'll come on Friday. Thanks for inviting me. Okay, great. All right, then. Uh, all right. Uh, to all the saints, thank you for, for uh, participating. Uh, we appreciate your fellowship, and we'll see you on the next one uh, uh, Friday. And then don't forget about our Sunday church service, uh, 2 p.m. Pacific time. Okay, thanks again, and bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus.